Greetings, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on atypical and advanced Parkinson disorders. We are going to be providing you today with an overview and discussion of these disorders on an application to LSVT Big. My name is Laura Gousset. I'm a physical therapist and one of the LSVT Big instructors. I'll be instructing and moderating today's session. Also joined by Dr. Beth Marcou, one of our physical therapy LSVT Big training and certification faculty. So thank you for joining us uh, wherever you may be coming from today. Briefly, here are our biographies uh, for your reference. If you are a physical therapist or an occupational therapist joining us, uh, you might need to save this information for CEU reporting purposes. We do have a couple of disclosures we'll briefly go over. Um, Dr. Marcoux and I both have financial and non-financial relationships with LSVT Global, including a preference for LSVT Big as a treatment technique, and we also receive consulting fees from LSVT Global. This is some brief information. Again, if you are a physical therapist or an occupational therapist, who is joining us for today's webinar, um, please note that this is a public webinar and it's not state registered for CEUs, but it may be used for self-reporting of CEUs if your state allows that. If you would like a certificate and a report of your activity, please email us after the webinar at webinars at lsvtglobal.com. You do have to attend for the full hour to earn the certificate for CEUs. So the plan for today's webinar is this. Um, we're going to go over logistics really briefly. Dr. Marcou and I will be presenting the webinar for about 45 to 50 minutes. And at the end of the webinar, we'll have some time for questions. Um, and the way that you can ask, ask questions during this webinar is to raise your hand and ask your question live, or you can type in your question at any time in the question box on your control panel. And we will save those and address those at the end of the webinar. So feel free as the webinar goes along to um, start typing in those questions. Also, please note that there's a handout section on your control panel. So if you wish to download and print a copy of today's slides, uh, we'd encourage you to do so for your own reference. You may have been emailed these slides in advance of the webinar as well. This webinar will be recorded, so if you'd like to view it again or share it with a friend, it'll be available on our LSVT Global blog. So during the webinar, our main purpose is to discuss the application of LSVT Big to individuals with atypical and advanced Parkinson's disease. At the very end of the webinar and after our question and answer time, there will be a short survey, which we'd love for you to fill out so that we get some feedback about today's webinar. It should take no more than five minutes to complete that survey. The objectives briefly for this webinar are to define advanced Parkinson's disease and the typical features that characterize it. Uh, we're going to be describing several atypical Parkinsonism disorders and then discuss the application of LSVT Big and how that protocol can be customized to meet the needs of people with either advanced or atypical Parkinson's disease. So in order to have a clinical diagnosis of idiopathic Parkinson's disease, um, there's no really great lab test or imaging study to definitively tell a person that they have uh, Parkinson's disease. So it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, first of all, there are usually early motor symptoms. So bradykinesia or slowness of movement, uh, tremor and rigidity. And a person does not need to have all three of those signs, but simply um, two out of three. The onset is usually insidious and there's specific non-motor and motor symptoms early on, which we'll talk about briefly a little bit later in our webinar today. The distribution of symptoms is usually asymmetrical, meaning one side is more severely affected than the other. Usually in the very early stages of Parkinson's disease, the symptoms are unilateral. It might present as a unilateral tremor, um, progressing towards bilateral symptoms later on, whether that be bilateral tremor, reduction of arm swing bilaterally, um, bilaterally decreased step length, and so on. The other thing that is a hallmark indicator of idiopathic Parkinson's disease that is that if all of those questions are answered positively, um, does the person respond post positively to 
um, anti-Parkinson medications such as Cinemet or dopamine agonist or something like that. Um, and usually that does take some time from the neurologist to observe, um, titrate the dosage correctly so that it can be seen if the person is responsive to uh, dopamine therapy. Lastly, there's a differential diagnosis process that the physician goes through. Um, and some of that is um, deciding whether or not a person has an atypical Parkinsonism, Parkinsonism rather than idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And so we wanted to just put through um, this clinical diagnosis of idiopathic PD to use because it'll be used later to differentiate um, atypical Parkinsonism from idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So when we use the term advanced Parkinson's disease, you might be wondering, well, what is considered advanced? Clinically, neurologists use a scale called the modified Hone and Yar scale as one of their rating scales. And it's fairly um, based on observation and it's a little bit subjective, but in the earliest stages, stage zero, this would probably be before someone even has uh, motor signs that are observable on examination, the person has no signs of disease. Usually at time of diagnosis, when a person has unilateral tremor or unilateral disease, it's considered a stage one. When it is a stage two or getting more towards the moderate stages of Parkinson's, the symptoms are now bilateral, meaning both sides, but there's no impairment of balance. The person still has intact balance um, and recovery. Stage three, which is considered the, the moderate stage of Parkinson's disease, the symptoms are bilaterally. The person is still fairly physically independent, but they might be beginning to have some balance problems. Stages four and five, which you can see are highlighted in yellow here, are what are considered the more advanced stages of Parkinson's disease or the later stages of Parkinson's disease. Stage four, the person is going to be exhibiting more severe disability. They might be able to walk, um, but need assistance of another person or a walker or a cane um, to be able to get around. But for the most part, um, with those devices, they can still get around fairly independently. Stage five, which is the most advanced stage of Parkinson's on the Honinyar scale, the person um, really needs to be in a wheelchair or cannot get out of a chair or a bed without physical assistance from another person. Some additional descriptors of advanced Parkinson's disease are this. You will see the onset of more motor complications despite an increasing amount of medication that might be taken or other therapy approaches that might be used as well. There might be what's called more on-off fluctuations where the medications don't work as long and therefore there are off times between, um, between doses. There might be more dyskinesias, which is actually a uh, excessive amount of movement, kind of a writhing or twisting movement that's caused by taking high dosage dosages of dopaminergic therapy. And cer certain drugs no longer work effectively anymore. Some other characteristics of advanced Parkinson's disease, the severity of that slowness of movement or small movement might become much more noticeable and impactful on daily life. A person might be experiencing a lot more rigidity and stiffness and also the freezing that they occur, uh, that occurs with movement or walking might be much more severe and disabling as well. Because of these um, advanced motor symptoms, it causes difficulties with walking, uh, mobility, even in bed or from bed to chair. That person might not be able to live alone. They might be at increased risk of falls and um, concurrent injuries, such as brain injury, orthopedic fractures, et cetera. And generally, assistance is needed with activities of daily living, such as um, toileting, dressing, sometimes even, um, even eating, or the person needs more assistive devices or adaptive aids to use those things. Posture might also worsen over time. Generally in the early stages of Parkinson's disease, posture is only minimally affected, uh, but can become more flexed or leaning to one side as the disease progresses as well. So the motor characteristics are one thing that definitely change and increase in severity as the disease progresses, but the non-motor characteristics of advanced Parkinson's disease also change in advance as the disease progresses. 
um, dementia becomes more prevalent and all other neuropsychological changes like slowness of processing attention um, memory ability to do two things at once dual tasking multitasking all become uh, much more difficult for many persons with advanced Parkinson's disease. As a result of the disease and sometimes medications that they're on, a person can experience um, psychoses or hallucinations. There are other uh, psychological problems that become more severe, such as depression, anxiety, and apathy. There might be sleep disorders that are more severe, um, pain, and also autonomic dysfunctions, such as um, increased difficulties with digestion, um, low blood pressure, et cetera. So these non-motor and motor symptoms, as you can see, can dramatically impair quality of life. And most people don't experience just, you know, one of those symptoms, but multiple symptoms that in, impact uh, multiple systems and multi do, multiple domains of functioning in daily life. Speech is another thing that is affected in advanced Parkinson's disease. Um, even early on, there's voice dysfunction in about 78% of individuals with Parkinson's disease. And this can be noticed as reduced loudness or a monotone voice, hoarseness, harshness, or a breathy voice quality. And because of this, along with uh, a masked face or decreased facial expression, individuals with Parkinson's can unfortunately sometimes be perceived as being disinterested when in fact they're they're really not disinterested at all. Later in the Parkinson's disease, we begin to see things like imprecise articulation, a vocal tremor and change in rate of the speech as well. You might also notice things like stuttering, like um, issues with speech or palilalia, which is um, a, kind of an effortless repetition of words and phrases, making it very difficult to understand what the, the person is trying to utter. And lastly, there are cognitive changes that affect a person's ability to communicate, including increased time needed for processing information and responding to information as well. Uh, and then lastly, before I turn it over to Beth, who's going to talk about the atypical Parkinsonisms, um, there are many secondary impairments that can occur as the result of having uh, Parkinson's disease for a long time, um, specifically if not a if that person is not managed uh, regularly by physical therapy and occupational therapy. One of those things can be cardiovascular deconditioning along with decreased muscular strength and weakness. And I think it stands to reason that as it becomes more difficult to, to move in everyday life, it becomes much more difficult to engage in regular exercise to prevent those things from happening. Um, and so that's a key role of physical therapists and occupational therapists is to work with individuals to design exercise plans that are safe and feasible and, and engaging and keep a person motivated as well. If a person has uh, changes in posture, whether it's a flex posture or posture to the side, um, you can imagine that over the course of many years, those things might become more fixed in nature rather than a a flexible curvature. They kind of begin to stay in that position. Um, this can lead to increased pain and in back and other areas of the body, but uh, low back pain is very common in people with Parkinson's disease and often related to this chronic flex posture. Over time, the loss of mobility can affect normal range of motion and balance. And then um, also, we see that in vast Parkinson's disease, people have more difficulties with swallowing and can have aspiration and develop aspiration pneumonia. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Beth to describe some of the atypical Parkinsonisms. And after that, we're gonna tell you um, really how this is, um, it might sound depressing at the outset of the symptoms, but there's a lot that can be done. And that's really the heart of our presentation is how we can help individuals with advanced PD and atypical Parkinson's, Parkinsonisms through LSVT Big. So what makes a, atypical Parkinsonisms different from idiopathic Parkinson's? Well, they also have one or more of the features similar to Parkinson's, the rigidity, the bradykinesia, the tremor, or the postural instability. But in addition, they have also some symptoms that are not seen in typical Parkinson's. And they may, these may include things like decreased blood pressure, 
or, or which leads to orthostatic hypertension. They might have difficulty sleeping. They might have incontinence and some other issues. And we'll talk about those as we talk about each of the individual atypical um, Parkinsonisms. So that's the plus, Parkinson's plus. Um, the disease course and the underlying pathology differs from idiopathic Parkinson's because it has a more rapid progression and often a shorter lifespan. Um, and they often don't respond well to or in the same way to the anti-Parkinson's medications. So um, it's really important for those reasons to actually get seen by a physical therapist or occupational therapist because behavioral therapy can make a huge difference in these clients' lives. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So um, because of this, it, the difficulty, it's very difficult to distinguish idiopathic from the atypicals. So it may take a while to see a diagnosis. Next slide. So there are five um, common, although atypical Parkinsonism is rare, there are five different um, Parkinsonisms that are seen in the clinics. Progressive supranuclear palsy, MSA or multiple systems atrophy, CBD or cortical basal degeneration, LBD or Lewy body dementia, and frontotemporal degeneration. And we're going to talk about each one of those um, independently. Next slide. So um, Parkinsonisms refer to a set of symptoms that are typically seen in Parkinson's disease, but are caused by other disorders. So patients often look like they have Parkinson's disease, but they have those added symptoms as well. So in these atypical Parkinsonisms, there is an accumulation of protein such as alpha-synuclea and tau. So alpha-synuclein is the primary structural component of Lewy bodies, and you'll see that in Parkinson's disease, multiple systems atrophy, and Lewy body dementia. Tau protein is supports and stabilizes the skeleton of the brain cells in the central nervous system. And when there's a defect in the tau, it accumulates and produces neurofibrillary tangles. And those are commonly seen in progressive supranuclear palsy, CBD, Alzheimer's disease, and frontotemporal dementia. Next slide. So the incidence and prevalence of these diseases, as I said, is very rare, but it frequently, they're frequently misdiagnosed as Parkinson's disease. Um, the rates of these atypicals vary from about one person to six people per 100,000 people, except for Lewy body dementia, which occurs more commonly in a, at a rate of about 400 people per 100,000. Um, as I noted before, the life expectancy is, is shorter than for idiopathic Parkinson's, and the rates vary from somewhere between 5 and 10 years. And hospitalizations are typically due to urinary tract infections, aspiration pneumonias, and falls. And so again, the speech therapy and, and physical and occupational therapy are very helpful in helping to reduce some of these um, hospitalizations. Next slide. So the first one I'm going to talk about is supranuclear palsy, or PSP. Um, and while this is similar to Parkinson's, you can use the anachronism FIGS to help differentiate it from idiopathic Parkinson's. Um, so F is for the frequency. Often you'll see these, the um, sudden falls in, in the early course of the disease. Um, and generally when they fall, they tend to fall backwards. Um, for the eye, it's again, these patients don't respond well to the typical anti-Parkinson's medications. Um, and so they're not, it's not particularly helpful. So what's left for them is typically the behavioral and exercise um, options, which are pretty good. These patients also present with a gaze palsy, which is the inability to look up or down. This gaze palsy is rarely present at the onset. Only about 8% of people have it initially. Um, but later, it takes about three to four years to develop. And you'll also see some blinking and, and other eye difficulties with these. And the S stands for speech and swallow changes. So you can see that this is the plus part of the um, uh, Parkinsonism plus for patients with supranuclear palsy. Next slide. There, in addition to the, some of the symptoms that were on that previous slide, you're going to see emotional and personality changes because um, PSP impacts the frontal lobe. Um, again, patients will uh, appear to be ap apathetic, that they won't care much about the things that they've typically cared about in the past. Um, they present with rocket sign, which is when the patient quickly moves from sitting to standing without thinking, and then they tend to fall backwards and hopefully into the chair. 
Um, bradyphrenia phren is slowness of thought. So again, those um, cognitive disorders you're beginning to see. And again, the probably one of the biggest focuses of PSP is the eye disturbances where they'll have double vision, they'll have forceful involuntary closing of their eyelids, they'll have reduced blinking, and difficulty maintaining eye contact. And they'll have a, a square wave jerk, which is an involuntary lateral movement um, and that interferes with their ability to actually target an object or look um, consistently at an, at an object. Next slide. Um, multiple systems atrophy is the second atypical that we're going to talk about. And um, this is a complex neurodegenerative disease that's broken into three different um, types. MSAP is um, and multiple systems atrophy Parkinsonism, and it's like Parkinson's disease, but they typically don't have that pill rolling tremor that you'll see with patients with Parkinson's. Um, they do have um, some degree of cerebellar dysfunction, which results in some stiff and slow movements. Um, the second one is MSAA for the autonomic system. This is also known as shy drager syndrome. And the emphasis on this is the degeneration of the autonomic system. And that system is the part of the nervous system that controls things like blood pressure and heart rate, digestion and elimination. And so because of both the impact on that system, you're going to see orthostatic hypotension, which is low blood pressure when someone changes from lying down to standing up. You're going to see constipation and some urinary incontinence. The final type of MSA is MSAC, and this is the form that affects the cerebellum. Um, Olivio-Ponto cerebellar atrophy um, indicates that the cerebellum is the one that's primarily impacted. And so because the cerebellum controls balance and gait, and coordination, what you see is patients present with ataxia, um, loss of balance, loss of coordination, um, changes in their gait and their speech. And also common is the frontal executive dysfunction. So memory and visual spatial functions can also be impaired. Next slide, please. The next one we're gonna talk about is the corticobasal degeneration or CBD. Um, this involves dementia at the frontal lobe where higher reasoning occurs and the temporal lobes which process memory. Um, CHIO can be used to help differentiate CBD from Parkinson's. Um, C because you're going to see cognitive changes that, that are mild early on and then progress to dementia later. Um, again, I, again, the atypicals tend to have a poor response to the anti-Parkinson's medication, so it's ineffective medication. Um, a is for the asymmetrical presentation and apraxia. And as Laura indicated earlier, the asymmetrical presentation is where you see one side impacted more than the other. In addition, you'll see what's called alien limb phenomenon, where um, patients don't recognize that affected side as their own limb. Um, and you'll see odd movements or feelings. So there'll be slowness, stiffness, shakiness, and clumsiness that's not typically seen with Parkinson's disease. Next slide, please. Um, and then there's Lewy body dementia. Um, this is a form of dementia that occurs when abnormal proteins known as Lewy body proteins interfere with normal brain function. Um, you see a progressive cognitive decline within the first 12 months of the onset of Parkinsonisms. And you'll see um, some core features. Fluctuating cognition, where some days they seem really good and other days they don't. Um, there'll be visual hallucinations. And then there'll be some um, the Parkinsonisms, the typical movements that you'll see with Parkinson's disease. Often with the rapid progression of post postural changes, you'll see general trunk flexion um, and could be either trunk flexion and or lateral function. So they kind of lean to the side or they kind of lean forward. Next slide. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So the last one we're going to talk about is frontotemporal degeneration. And this is the most common form of dementia in people under the age of 60. The hallmark of this is a gradual progressive decline in behavior or language um, with memory usually, usually relatively well preserved. Um, as it progresses, it becomes increasingly difficult for people to plan or organize activities, to behave appropriately in social or work situ situations, to interact with others, and to care for themselves, resulting in their need to depend on caregivers. And generally, as I said, it occurs in people in their 50s and 60s. 
Um, there's also some speech aphasias that um, are associated with this, in which you see reduced fluency of speech. And typically, people talk at about 140 words per minute, but um, patients with um, frontotemporal degeneration will speak at about 40 to 45 words per minute. They'll have difficulty with grammar, and they'll have difficulty in comprehension. Next slide. So it's important to um, remember that the atypicals are not managed well with medication or surgical treatment like, like in Parkinson's disease. Um, and it's very important to remember that the symptoms and presentations can vary. And so getting a diagnosis is often very difficult. Um, compensatory strategies may need to be implemented earlier versus the restorative treatment methods that you see in idiopathic Parkinson's. So for these patients, it's important to start things like LSVT big and loud as soon as possible, because we know that they have a real impact on patients that don't respond to um, medication. Next slide. So for the rehabilitation of patients with advanced Parkinson's, which is honing yarn stages four and five, and atypical Parkinson's, our goals are to maintain or improve physical capacity. We want to focus on vocal loudness, quality of voice, pitch range, and speech intelligibility, and that would all be done through LSVT loud. And we also want to focus on the quality and, and bigness of movement so we can get patients to move as normally as possible and maintain that what posture they have, um, improve and maintain good balance and range of motion and strength. Um, our goals are to maintain those vital functions of swallowing and moving safely and to maintain functional communication and movement so that we can enhance safety and reduce caregiver burden. Um, and using external cueing or augmentation for the care team is also extremely important. And we know that both big and loud are, are vital to this. So it's important that everybody get a chance to um, be treated with it. Next slide. So again, the multidisciplinary team is really important. And through research, we know that exercise is medicine. And it's especially important for those people who have disorders that don't respond to medicine and surgery. So you'll see in yellow, um, the allied health team of speech therapists, physical therapists, and occupational therapists, um, because we know that exercise is medicine. And with, with careful speech and physical and occupational therapy, we can help to maintain, possibly improve the function of clients, and more importantly, in these later stages, to help reduce the burden on caregivers. Next slide. So we know LSVT big is designed for use in patients in all stages of Parkinson's disease. And while it's an exercise protocol, it is adapted to each individual patient and their unique needs. So we're gonna talk about some adaptations and considerations. But first we'll talk about what LSVT big is. So LSVT big is a exercise protocol that's delivered by a certified LSVT big physical or occupational therapist. It's a one-on-one -on -one treatment, um, not done in a group. It's done one-on-one, -on -one, um, four days a week, four consecutive days a week for four weeks, um, 16 sessions in one month, and each session lasts for 60 minutes or one hour. Um, the client is given daily carryover assignments. These are small things that they need to do to help to remind them or cue them to move big, and they're given daily homework, which is intended to reinforce the, um, the exercise program and the um, ability to move big. Next slide. The treatment session is, um, this is a, an example or a snapshot of a, of a typical session, and you can see on the left-hand side that it starts with seven maximum daily exercises. Um, and we're going to talk about how these can be adapted, but typically the first two are done in sitting and the rest are done in standing. Um, in addition, we do what are called five functional component tasks. And so we try to identify what are five things that are important to the client, that one step kind of things that they want to be able to do. Um, and some examples are sit to stand, reaching for a drink or pulling up their covers. Um, and then we work on longer or more complex tasks, that, again, that are identified by the patient or the family. And they're typically things like getting in and out of bed to use the bathroom or commode, um, transferring from a wheelchair to a toilet, or getting in and out of a car. And um, the, the task is broken down and then built up back um, consecutively over four weeks, making it a little bit harder each day and each time they try it, until by the end of four weeks or more, they're able to perform them. And then every session involves big walking, and it may involve a device or um, assistance, or it may be um, with a wheelchair. 
Next slide. The next, this video is, a, is an example of one of the exercises it's stepping forward. And you can imagine how hard this might be for some people to do. So this is the standard, and then we'll show you some ways to adapt it. I'm going to have you watch Jenny and do what she does, and she'll model the exercise first, and then we'll practice. Be sure and start with your big posture, and you're going to step forward, open up big, step back big. And you can imagine how that might be a very important thing to be able to do just in terms of going into a closet or um, doing any kind, any kind of daily activities, walking, whatever. Um, the big question is, can these exercises be adapted for people who have less abilities? Absolutely, um, they can. And in the next two examples, you're going to see Bob and Jenny um, do this exercise both in the seated position, that same exercise, and in the supine position. We're going to do a big step, big reach, good big posture, nice, and back big, good, big step, good, back big. And this one is in the supine position. Next, we're doing our step forward. Okay, so you're going to start like you are. You're going to bring your leg or your right leg up to put your foot on the bed and arms out to the side all together. Okay? Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So leg up big, arms out big. Good. Big hands, big fingers. Good. And then back big. Hands in, legs. Yeah, good. Nice job. Okay? Do it again. Big step. Good. And down big. So through adaptation of these exercises, you might be able to get help patients roll over in bed, get in and out of bed. Um, and depending on the stage they're in, they may start doing them supine and advance to being able to do them in sitting. Um, but they are all very important because they are the foundations of most movements that we do. So those seven daily activities are extremely important. So as shown in the um, videos, you can do these um, exercises in sitting or supine, um, and we'll talk about more on the next slide, please. So some of the physical challenges that patients face are, are balance, and so having them do the exercises in standing may require additional support. So you can have them stand um, with a chair on either side um, or between two countertops to be able to do some of the exercises and to work on balance. For endurance, if patients are very um, weak in the beginning, we would reduce the number of repetitions and we would scale the intensity as needed. So maybe they would do three repetitions instead of the 10 or 15 that we um, hope to eventually get to. Um, patients may also need to use assistive or adapted devices for walking. They might need raised toilets, they might need higher chairs um, in order to be able to accomplish the same sit to stand or walking that um, others do. Um, we would take care to limit exacerbating the orthostatic hypotension, so watching to make sure that patients have a chance to adapt from lying down to sitting up so that they don't um, have their blood pressure drop too drastically. And we also work with early with the caregiver training when physical assistance is needed or will be needed later. So we try very early on to train the caregiver to work with the patients. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, but cueing and modeling are extremely important for that. And, and we would show the caregivers how to do that. Next slide, please. There are also cognitive and non-motor challenges. Um, so simple and redundant cueing along with modeling facilitates motor learning and retention. So big and loud can be learned by almost anyone. And modeling is extremely important, even if you're um, even if the patient is not verbal, um, they can learn by modeling and through cueing. So um, both are extremely important in working with advanced stages. Intensity of dosage is a key in producing meaningful and lasting changes. So we see the client four times a week for four weeks. That's 16 sessions, but often in the advanced stages, they need more than those 16 sessions to be able to accomplish the long-term goals or to reduce the burden on the caregiver. So when caregiver training is early caregiver training, when carryover of function to home and homework is challenging, um, but again, through working with the caregiver, we can get them to accomplish the, um, the goal of maintaining and improving function. I'm going to turn it back to Laura. All right. Thank you, Beth, for that great overview. 
Um, and I think where we're bridging now is going to really the goal of LSVT Big is improving function. Whether you have early PD, advanced PD, and atypical BD, it's not just learning a set of exercises. It's learning how to apply that and move better in, in daily life. Typically with LSVT Big, our goal for the early to moderate stages is that person would learn a new internal cue of how to rescale their amplitude of movement so that they understand how it feels like and are able to generate more normal um, amplitude or size of movement in everyday life, regardless of what activity they're doing. It could be walking, getting out of a chair, getting dressed, fine motor skills. Um, but with peace, people with advanced Parkinson's disease or atypical Parkinsonism, often what comes up with that is difficulties with memory, um, learning, sometimes even depression or dementia that require the person to be cued or reminded to use their bigger movements in everyday life. Um, now, what we say to our therapists that are getting trained in LSVT big is that is not necessarily a bad thing because if you can help a person with Parkinson's disease move from a point in their life where they are physically being assisted with getting out of a chair or getting dressed and now all they need is a verbal cue to remain, remind them to use their bigger movements that really reduces caregiver burden and improves the safety and independence of the individual uh, with Parkinson's disease and through that the person will experience improved quality of life and self-efficacy which is something important for every person. The daily exercises become vital though, because what happens in this one month treatment span is that because of the intense dosage and nature of the treatment, um, people improve. Even people with atypicals or advanced Parkinson's disease um, improve often very significantly. Uh, but the only way to maintain that improvement over time or slow the symptom progression is to keep doing the exercises on a daily basis, just like you would take your exercise, your medicine on a daily basis as well um, to help with whatever symptoms that you're treating. The daily exercises help to remind people to keep their movements big every day so they don't lose sight and lose feeling of what that feels like to move bigger, but we recognize it might need to be customized for practical implementation. So we try to really work with individual and decide where are you going to do your exercises, what time of day, what position are you going to do them in, who's going to help you. When needed, we enlist team support. And um, our best recommendation is if you have advanced PD or an atypical Parkinsonism, um, don't rely solely on your spouse or one caregiver, but start to talk to other people around you whether they be friends, family, or even hire caregivers to say, you know, who can step in and, you know, assist me, coach me, help me with my exercises um, as I might need more help as, as the years pass. We also have something called the Homework Helper DVD, which can be quite helpful. It's the LSVT Big Exercises in both the standard and adapted versions on video it can be um, purchased as a dvd or downloaded or streamed and uh, that can be quite helpful for a number of people as well just want to show you a quick example of handwriting so this is a handwriting example from an individual with advanced parkinson's disease and had severe cognitive impairments he had given up writing quite a while ago but still had a desire to write um, you can see that his writing is um, really illegible. He tried to write the standardized sentence of whales live in the blue ocean from one of our standardized tests and pre um, you certainly can't read anything at all. Post um, now we, so we've been working on large amplitude movements throughout his body for four weeks. You can see that his writing is bigger but still not necessarily legible. I think I can pick out a few things like live and maybe in the uh, but the rest of it is quite difficult to to um, to read. Now, in this case scenario, the therapist did not work specifically on the handwriting task um, as a functional task. So what you're seeing here is just a generalized improvement in amplitude um, through training. So the therapist really had a question in her mind and she wanted to know, well, if what would happen if he was cued to write bigger? Like I, even though we didn't train that in therapy, I'm gonna ask him if he can write bigger. And you can see on the post column on the side, 
that yes, indeed, even though he had tremor and his letters were a little bit shaky, you could definitely read almost all of those words there um, without with exception of maybe number 10. So for this gentleman, it was a huge improvement in his quality of life because now he could write um, words down or phrases down or jot notes down when he desired to and it could be legible. Um, but his wife had to remind him to use his big handwriting. So the functional tasks that, um, the functional task specific training that we use in LSVT BIG is more than just exercises. And this is one of the differentiators, I would say, between a community-based fitness program, um, which is wonderful for people with Parkinson's versus therapy. And so we really start with those core exercises that Beth mentioned that are fundamental and really improve um, amplitude and quality of movement. But then in the second half of the session, we say, let's work on translating using that same big movement with functional tasks that are important to you. And so we uh, really request the input of not only the patient, but the family to choose tasks that are going to be the most meaningful in daily life for that patient. In the next slide, I'm going to show you a few examples. Um, it might be simple things like getting up from the toilet, um, a bed, a low recliner, um, dining room chair, wheelchair, if you think in normal everyday life, just how many times we typically go from sitting to standing from various surfaces, it's, it's pretty astounding if you stop to think about it. Turning in bed can be very difficult for many people with Parkinson's disease, and this is a frequently practiced functional task uh, with, for many patients, or getting in and out of bed. Sometimes it's the ability to safely get in and out of the tub in the shower and really clear your legs without someone having to lift your legs up over the ledge. Dressing, um, even if it's just a, a little bit of help that's needed with dressing, such as to get the legs through the, the, the pant leg holes or the arms in the sleeve or, or buttoning, for example. Um, eating, um, certainly it's challenging if a person can't accurately or independently bring their fork or their cup to their mouth. And so through amplitude specific training, we can work on that. It could be being steady enough and able enough to stand and brush your teeth or wash your hands or do grooming or hygiene tasks. It could be short distance walking around the home as well. So these are just a few examples and it requires the skill of the therapist really sitting down and interviewing you to understand what is it in your life that you're struggling with that you really wanna work on so that that therapy protocol can be customized for you. In every session, we try to work on big walking if the person has some mobility um, abilities at all. So that could be walking with a walker or a cane. I've also worked with patients that really use a wheelchair full time. And uh, just as pe persons with Parkinson's often exhibit very small steps, some of them use very small strokes when they push the wheelchair as well. And so we work on bigger strokes of the wheelchair or bigger steps, bigger posture when working on big walking. We will really look at the environment and the distance that's required in each person's life. Look at the challenges in that person's home. Maybe the person has obstacles, furniture, narrow hallways, doorways that contribute to freezing problems. And we can use the LSVT big protocol to very specifically address those freezing issues each person has. Our goal is to really keep it simple. Um, we have this simple redundant cue of, you know, walk big, stand big, um, you know, swing your arms big, whatever it is that the person needs so that it becomes ingrained in their brain. And we also train the caregiver how to use those uh, think big cues to improve walking around the home as well. As part of every session during the four weeks, a person has LSVT big homework. We have carryover assignments. So there's things that we say, today, here's a new way. I want you to use your bigger movements in everyday life. And we require exercise practice at every at home as well. Now, many individuals are able to do those exercises independently um, on their own or with a homework helper video. And sometimes it, a, a caregiver or a coach is needed or desirable. And in those instances, we really invite those caregivers and coaches into the session so that we can train them how to um, coach the patient with Parkinson's at home. Now, after LSVT big, um, it, 
exercise is not over. <laughs> like I said, it's so important to continue with the exercises once a day forever, um, just as you would take medications for some things forever. That could be with a coach or caregiver, could be with a homework helper video, as I said before. And re more recently, we have started groups called Big for Life, and we have one for speech called Loud for Life. And so if there's one in your area, you may be able to uh, enroll in one of those and practice your LSVT big exercises and other movements in a group of individuals, which is really quite fun. And then lastly, we really recommend tune-ups. Um, so ask your LSVT big PT or OT when you're going through treatment, uh, when will my next checkup or tune-up be with you? And for people with more rapidly progressive disorders like atypical Parkinsonisms or advanced Parkinsonism um, with maybe some cognitive changes, we generally recommend tune-ups every three to six months. And what that would entail is a re-evaluation and also um, a short duration of sessions if needed to help maintain um, those previous gains and to slow symptom progression down as well. So the bottom line that we want to leave you with today is that there is hope. So don't discount therapy just because the disease is advanced or it's an atypical Parkinson's disease. Um, we've seen clinically um, through many, many therapists over the last 10 years that people with advanced Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonisms can have amazing outcomes um, that we've been very surprised by pleasantly that have improved quality of life quite dramatically. This is a quote from a gentleman with Parkinson's disease, and I thought it was a nice quote because it really illustrates the functional improvements that someone can make. And so he said, here are some activities that I avoided, but which are now part of my routine again, getting up from a low couch, we all know that's difficult sometimes, getting into and out of my car, which is low to the ground, putting bills in my wallet, retrieving my cell phone from a pants pocket and putting it back, properly donning a sports jacket and buttoning shirt all in four weeks. Um, and so that intensity of training really does improve quality of life. And while those might seem like small improvements, those are huge improvements with, for a person that is striving to maintain their independence in functioning. So in summary, we just want to leave you with that LSVT big can be applicable to all stages of Parkinson's disease and can be customized to meet each patient's needs and treatment settings. It can increase independence, speed, quality, and safety with communication, mobility, and ADLs. And our mantra is restore function as much as possible, improve function as much as possible, and maintain function as much as possible. We know that these um, disorders carry unique challenges, which require creative solutions and increased caregiver involvement, but it is possible. And so now I'm going to um, open up for questions in just a few minutes. And to get you started, there are a few ways to answer, to ask questions. One is you can type your question into the question box on the control panel, and I'll be reading those out loud um, in just a few moments, and either Beth or I will answer those. The second way is that you can raise your hand. There should be a little hand icon on your control panel. If you click on that, I'll find out who raised their hands. I will have to call out your name so you know that it's your turn. Um, make sure that your microphone will be unmuted and we'll unmute your microphone as well and then you can ask it out loud. The third way, if we run out of time or if you think of any questions later, you can email us at info at lsvtglobal.com. While you're doing that, I'm just gonna give you a, a little bit of information. If you are a person with Parkinson's or a family member, um, you can find clinicians that are certified in the LSVT protocols that are on our website. And we just launched a new website this week at lsvtglobal.com. Click on Find Clinicians, and you can do a search option for either LSVT Loud, which is a speech therapy, or LSVT Big, which is the physical and occupational therapy. Enter your location. So put in your city and state or your zip code, and then click on the little box that says, I agree to the terms and conditions. Um, and then ask your doctor for a referral to one of the clinicians that you found. All of their contact information is on there, so if you have any questions, um, you can email those clinicians directly. Here are some resources for you. On our website and blog, you'll find um, webinars that are available to anyone. They're free, they're public. Um, you can register for our upcoming live webinars, or you can view 
a huge library we have of on-demand webinars that are recorded. We have LSVT Big and LSVT Loud seminars in many cities throughout the nation. And so please check our blog under the events to see if there is one coming in your area. It's a great opportunity to hear from the instructors live and practice some of the LSVT exercises with the workshop participants at that course. I have given you a little bit of information on our homework helper DVDs I mentioned before on our Big for Life and Loud for Life groups, which you can also find on our website. And if you have other questions, you can email us anytime and be connected with an expert by emailing info at lsvtglobal.com. So with that, I'm going to open it up for some questions here. Just give me one moment. Okay, and so um, this sounds like it might be coming from a clinician, and she says, um, after a patient has finished the four weeks, they're, they are going to need in-home assistance with exercise. Many have of these advanced patients have older caregivers as well who are not capable of assisting with the um, person with Parkinson's with the exercises. What are your discharge plans or follow-up care for treatment? Um, Kristen, great question, and you're right, that often is the, the case that um, the, the caregiver or the spouse at home isn't always the ideal one to be helping with exercises, and I think that's when it's really important for us as part of an interdisciplinary team is to reach out to those other team members. Um, specifically in this case, I would say um, to reach out to the social worker or case manager to see is there um, potential for in-home assistance, like through a home health care agency where a PCA could be hired? Um, or does the person with Parkinson's have other family members or friends that maybe haven't thought of um, that could be trained to help with the um, LSVT big or LSVT loud exercises in follow-up? Um, also, sometimes the homework helper DVD is really all the patient needs. If the spouse is able to put that DVD in and kind of set up the environment so that they're doing them in a safe place and just monitoring. Um, sometimes that can work really well as well since it's essentially a therapist in your home doing with them. Um, and those are available in the seated and supine positions as well for people that really aren't safe to be standing on their own doing the exercises. Um, Beth, did you have any other, anything else that you wanted to add to that one? I would just suggest that you might check with um, local um, charities or organizations like their churches or um, other community organizations. Um, grandkids are a great resource as well. Um, neighbors. So I think, yeah, there's there's probably a lot of options, but I, I and the and the homework helper is, is a great one as well. All right, thank you. Um, while we're waiting just a couple minutes to see if any other questions come in, I just wanted to alert you that there are two slides at the very end of this webinar. Oh, hold on, I clicked a link there by accident. Oh, let's see if I can get back to our show. All right, um, there are uh, there's a list of related organizations related to some of these atypical Parkinsonisms. So Cure PSP is at psp.org. It's a fantastic organization that has a lot of really specific information on the different atypical Parkinsonisms, um, has the most information on PSP, but go ahead and check out that website. Um, there's an MSA coalition, the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration, Lewy Body Dementia Association, and the Alzheimer's Association. So if you are um, experiencing one of those disorders or you know someone who is, please know that although they're rare conditions, you certainly not are not alone. And there is a lot of support out there for you, um, both educational information support and uh, support groups otherwise. So please do check those out. If you're looking to learn more about Parkinson's disease, we are fortunate to have a number of wonderful organizations in our nation including the Parkinson's Foundation, the American Parkinson's Disease Foundation, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the Davis Finney Foundation, the World Parkinson's Coalition. And I know there are others that are that we probably neglected on there, but these are some of the, the bigger ones. Um, if you're joining us from other areas around the globe, um, there are many um, Parkinson's organizations specific to each country 
for each region of the globe as well. And if you need help finding um, Parkinson's connections in your um, area of the world, please don't hesitate to contact us and we're really help, uh, glad to help you. Okay, um, here's just one comment I'll, I'll share. Just thank you for submitting this comment. Um, I live near a university with OT and PT programs and I recommend my patients contact the pre-OT or pre-PT groups at that university to get help, yes. So often they would need to pay, but there is a win-win for the student and the patient, and they can usually get a lower rate than private paying for an agency for an aid who isn't invested in what they're doing. Uh, thank you so much for that for that great comment. Um, coming from a university, I know of many patients that were helped by students that really um, had a heart for helping people with neurological conditions and were able and willing to come over and help with exercises um, on a regular basis. So thank you for that. All right, and it looks like those are all of the questions for today and we're nearly at the top of the hour. Um, so I just thank you again for coming to our website or to our webinar today. I'm um, sorry about this. I'm going to go back to where we were before. Um, there is a survey that we'll be launching at the end of the webinar today. Um, please do take a few minutes to launch and answer that survey. We appreciate all of the feedback that we get from you. And please, once again, check out our new website. Let us know what you think and email us anytime that you have any questions. Have a great day.